Anatomy and Physiology 1, Chapter 12, Nervous Tissue. The nervous system includes various organs like the brain and spinal cord, receptors of sense organs, so this would be like the eyes and the ears, and then nerves that connect to other systems in the body. Nervous tissue contains two main kinds of cells, which we will go through in the first part of the chapter. Neurons for intercellular communication, so communication between cells. And then neuroglia, which are also known as glial cells. These are going to help with the survival and the functioning of the neurons. They also can assist with structure of nervous tissue. So you can think of the neuroglia as helpers for the neurons. We can divide the nervous system up into two primary categories. These are the two big ones and then we can kind of branch down from there. The central nervous system is what it sounds like. This is the central primary area of the nervous system right at your core. We'll look at a picture of that in a little bit. The peripheral nervous system, which is in your periphery, this is what's going to come off of the central nervous system. So focusing in on the central nervous system first, it can be abbreviated as CNS. So you are going to see that through the notes. Um, we may start using CNS instead just to kind of shorten things up a bit. This again is going to include the brain and spinal cord as well as any other nervous tissue, connective tissue, and blood vessels that are feeding or supporting the brain and spinal cord. The job of the CNS is to process and coordinate any information coming from inside and outside of your body. So this would be any kind of sensory information. So anything you feel, see, hear, taste, smell, all of those things come in and we're going to be able to process and coordinate what we are sensing. The motor commands are the activity or activities we will carry out as a result of the sensory information that came in. For example, if a bug landed on your arm and proceeded to bite you, the sensory information of that pain would go into the central nervous system where we would then understand that there was pain. And the central nervous system would direct a motor command which would cause your skeletal muscle to swat the bug away. So this is going to be the action as a response to the sensory info that comes in. In addition, in the central nervous system, we also, um, this is where we're going to be able to learn, memorize, and also um, process emotions. This is what we call the higher order functions that are very much human. Peripheral nervous system, or PNS, includes all nervous tissue outside of the central nervous system and the enteric nervous system, which is the ENS. We're going to come back to the enteric nervous system in just a few minutes. So peripheral nervous system, anything outside of central. It is going to deliver sensory information to the central nervous system and also carry motor commands out. So this is going to include the nerves and nerves are bundles of axons. And if you're not really sure what an axon is, we're going to come back to that also. But these are bundles of axons that also have connective tissue and blood vessels with and around them. They carry sensory information and also motor commands. These nerves can be either cranial, which are connected to the brain, and spinal, which are attached to the spinal cord. So let's go forward just a little bit and look 
at our two big divisions before we get into the smaller divisions. So in this picture, central nervous system or CNS is our brain and spinal cord. So here's the brain and then the spinal cord coming down. So that is in fact at your center. And then coming off of the central nervous system, we see all these little yellow wires, or that's what they look like to me anyway. Little wires coming off, going down the arms, down the legs. Those wires or nerves are what we call our peripheral nervous system or PNS. So this is any of the tissue outside of the central. And their job is going to be to carry sensory information in through some nerves to the central nervous system to be processed. And then also we may carry out a motor command, which is a call to action, and we may react accordingly. Okay, so the, the PNS, peripheral nervous system, which remember was our nerves, can further be divided into some more subcategories. Um, and they include the afferent and efferent divisions. And these are pretty easy to remember based on the first letter of each of those words. So the afferent division carries sensory information into the central nervous system. So as it says, from receptors in your peripheral tissues and organs back to the central nervous system. So I like to remember that by remembering the word accessing, which also starts with an A. So A afferent, A accessing. We're going to be carrying information into or accessing the central nervous system. The efferent division carries motor commands out of the central nervous system. So we're going to go from the CNS to muscles, glands, or fat. So we're going to carry motor commands out. And efferent starts with E, and the word exiting starts with E. So we are exiting, we're leaving, and taking motor commands out. Now in the peripheral nervous system, we also have receptors. Receptors can detect changes in the body, and they can also respond to stimuli. So if a bright light shines in your eye, receptors in the eye can respond to that by changing the width of your pupil or even causing you to eventually close your eyes. So receptors can be neurons or they can be specialized cells or even complex organs like the eye or ear. So they're going to pick up on changes. Effectors are the target organs that will respond to motor commands. So again, these guys are the ones performing the action. They're the ones that will react and carry out an action. So the efferent division, so we just talked about how the peripheral nervous system has an afferent and an efferent division. The efferent, remember exiting, division of the PNS can further be divided into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And we're going to see a chart that's going to kind of all tie these together and organize them, which will be a great review chart. So the somatic nervous system, or SNS, is going to control skeletal muscle contractions. Control skeletal muscle contractions. These can be both voluntary, which is primarily what we think of when we think of our skeletal muscle, and also involuntary, like reflexes that are involuntary. The autonomic nervous system, or ANS, is going to control subconscious actions, so things that you do not think about and that are not voluntary. This would include contractions of your smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or heart, and also when your glands secrete. And clearly, we're not in charge of any of that. The autonomic nervous system can either be sympathetic or parasympathetic. So the sympathetic division has a stimulating effect. 
In other words, this is the part of the nervous system that is triggered when there is an exciting or maybe scary moment. It's going to cause your heart rate, blood pressure, and blood sugar to all go up so that you can fight or run or deal with a stressful situation. This is sometimes referred to as the fight or flight response. Parasympathetic nervous system has a relaxing effect. This is what is often referred to as the rest and digest part of the nervous system. Um, when we are nice and calm, our heart rate, blood pressure, and blood sugar can decline. The enteric nervous system, which we said we would come back to, that's the ENS, is going to include over 100 million neurons in the walls of your digestive tract. This is as many or even more than what we have in our spinal cord, and they use the same neurotransmitters as the brain uses. Neurotransmitters, recall, are chemical messengers. The enteric nervous system will help to begin and also coordinate visceral reflexes locally. So it will coordinate the digestive organs locally without using any help from the central nervous system. This can also be influenced by the autonomic nervous system, which makes sense because if you think about when you're super, super stressed and the sympathetic nervous system or fight or flight kicks on, your digestive rate is going to go down. Um, because when you are fighting for your life or in a very stressful situation, the last thing the body is focused on is digestion. So here's our chart, which will help to kind of review everything we've talked about so far as far as the subdivisions of the nervous system and is a great summary slide. So we'll start from the bottom here, receptors. So remember, receptors are the things that will pick up on stimuli. So this could be special receptors like um, our sense of smell, our eyes, our ears. Um, these guys monitor smell, taste, vision, balance, and hearing. We also have visceral sensory receptors. These are receptors in our internal organs. So if you have a stomach ache, these, the receptors in the stomach wall can actually let you know that your stomach is not feeling well. And then somatic sensory receptors are going to monitor skeletal muscles, joints, and your skin. So all of these receptors pick up on change or any type of stimulus, and then they send that information through the peripheral nerves. Remember, the nerves are the ones that either exit or access. So we're trying to send information to the central nervous system. So we're going to use the afferent nerves, which are the accessing nerves. So we're going to carry that information up through the afferent nerves of the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system which, remember, is the brain and spinal cord. So it is going to process that information and decide what to do about it. A motor command may be sent out through the efferent or exiting division, which are the uh, motor nerves or the efferent nerves. So the efferent division is going to send a motor command to either the somatic nervous system, which is the one that controls skeletal muscle, or it may send a motor command to the autonomic nervous system, which is the one we talked about where we can either have parasympathetic or calming effect on the smooth and cardiac muscle and glands, or the sympathetic division, which has an excitatory effect or our fight or flight, on the smooth and cardiac muscle and glands. So this is our overview of receptors, peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, back to peripheral again, and then effectors that take action.
So now that we've got all of our divisions straight, we can talk about the most um, important cell, or one of the most important cells in the nervous system, which is known as the neuron. So the neuron is considered the functional unit of the nervous system. Its job is to send and receive signals. So I like to think of it as the cell that does all the communicating in the nervous system. It's going to communicate, process information, and also control. And in order to understand how neurons work, the first thing we want to do is know what the parts of a neuron are. So um, you can also watch a short video um, in the anatomical um, illustration playlist of a drawing of a neuron and all of its components, but we're going to look at that in the form of a slide today. So we've got first the cell body. The cell body is also called the soma, and this is where we're going to find the nucleus. We've got, in addition, around the nucleus and organelles in the cell body, we have cytoplasm, which is known as perikaryon, mitochondria, which produce energy for the neuron, and then we've also got rough ER and ribosomes. And if you remember back to chapter 3, those guys make protein. So in the perikaryon, which remember is our cytoplasm of the cell body, we're going to have some protein fibers called neurofilaments, neurotubules, and neurofibrils. And these guys are going to give the cell body support and structure so that it can actually stand up. Um, we also note what are called nissel bodies. And nissel bodies are very dense areas of rough ER and ribosomes in the perikaryon. This can make the neuron appear gray, which is sometimes referred to as gray matter. So let's go ahead to a neuron picture and just kind of look at what we've got so far. So I like this one, but I like this one better. So this would be our soma or cell body. Our nucleus is inside the soma or cell body. Coming off of the cell body are these fine finger-like projections called dendrites. I haven't actually talked to you about those yet, but, but we will, so let's go ahead and look at them while we're here. This area of cytoplasm is known as the perikaryon. We have mitochondria, which we can see here and here and here. We also have around the nucleus rough endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes as well in little clusters. So when we have big clusters of ribosomes and rough ER like that, we call it nissel bodies, which makes the neuron appear gray and grainy. And then you can see fine filaments here. These are the protein tubes that act as a cytoskeleton to give the neuron shape and structure. Okay, so the dendrites are short branched processes. We just saw what they looked like. Um, they branch and branch to little bitty fine spines and these fine dendritic spines are going to receive information from other neurons and they make up about 80 to 90 percent of the neurons surface area. Coming off of the cell body is a long slender axon. This axon is also filled with cytoplasm and its main job is to propagate which is kind of fancy for travel or carry. It's going to propagate electrical signals which are known as action potentials and we're going to talk a lot about those in the second half of the chapter. The axoplasm is the cytoplasm of the axon. So here's our more basic image. We just talked about the cell body. Coming off of the cell body is the long slender axon, which again is filled with cytoplasm known as axoplasm. 
The axon also has a specialized membrane called the axolemma, and there are two areas of note as well on the axon. We have the initial segment, which is the base of the axon, and then the axon hillock, which is the thick area that attaches the initial segment to the cell body. So let's take a look at that. So this thickened area where the cell body kind of meshes into the axon, that is the axon hillock. To the right in this drawing of the axon hillock is the initial segment. So this is like where the axon actually begins, the initial segment. And the axon has a membrane called the axolemma. And remember, it is filled with cytoplasm called axoplasm. Next, we have collaterals. So collaterals are branches that come off of the axon. And then our main axon is going to eventually start to branch into fine extensions called telodendria. The telodendria will then end, end in axon terminals, which are also known as synaptic terminals or synaptic knobs. So let's take a look at those. So here is an example of a collateral. So this is just a branch off of an axon known as a collateral. And then as we move down the primary axon, you can see that it branches into finer branches, which are called telodendria. The telodendria end in little buttons or knobs called axon terminals or synaptic terminals. So there are a few kinds of neurons found in the human body, but the one we're focusing on for this chapter is the most common, multi, or most common neuron in the central nervous system, known as the multipolar neuron. The multipolar neuron is the kind of neuron we've been looking at in the last two pictures. It has one long axon and two or more dendrites, very common in the CNS, and all motor neurons that control skeletal muscles. So this is a super, super common neuron. And it's the one we're really going to use for the rest of the chapter, which is why we focused in on it. So again, cell body and dendrites in the multipolar neuron, a long axon, which branches into telodendria, and then we end at the synaptic or axon terminals. So neurons can be classified as sensory, and you can imagine that those guys are going to pick up on sensations or sensory information. Motor neurons, which are going to be the ones carrying out, carrying instructions about action. And then interneurons, which are the go-betweens. So let's go over those three um, in general. Starting with sensory neurons. So sensory neurons are going to be afferent, which makes sense. This is, these are our accessing neurons, the ones that carry information in to the central nervous system. Their cell bodies are grouped in what are called ganglia. Ganglia, the definition, is collections of neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Collections of neuron cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. The processes or afferent fibers extend from sensory receptors to the central nervous system. So again, we're picking up on sensations and we're carrying that information into the central nervous system. Somatic sensory neurons will monitor our external environment and visceral sensory neurons will monitor our internal environment. Types of sensory receptors. 
So we have enteroceptors, which are going to monitor your internal systems like digestive and urinary. Internal senses like when you stretch your tissue or deep pressure or pain. Exteroreceptors are going to monitor your external environment like temperature and complex senses like sight, smell, or hearing. Proprioceptors will monitor the position and movement of your muscles and joints. So moving to motor neurons. Motor neurons are efferent. Remember, exiting. We're carrying out instructions from the central nervous system to the actors, which are the effectors, via efferent fibers. We have somatic motor neurons. These are going to direct skeletal muscle and visceral motor neurons, which will control all other peripheral effectors like smooth and cardiac muscle or glands. Interneurons are in the brain and spinal cord mostly, and they're located between the sensory and motor neurons. Their job is to distribute sensory information and then coordinate motor activity. They're involved in higher functions like planning or memory or your ability to learn. So this moves us to neuroglia, which is the other super important cell type in the human body. These guys are the support staff. That's kind of how you could look at them. They're going to make up half the volume of the nervous system, and there are many types in the CNS and the PNS. So let's begin with the types of neuroglia in the CNS. So there are four to focus on, the astrocyte, the ependymal cell, the oligodendrocyte, and microglia. So we'll start with the astrocyte. Um, and this again is a great chart for, to kind of summarize everything in one spot. Um, it reminds us here that these are found in the central nervous system. But looking at the astrocytes specifically, um, the astrocytes have large cell bodies with, it looks like little arms branching off of the cell body. Their job is to maintain the blood brain barrier, also known as the BBB. The blood brain barrier, you can kind of think of it as your, um, your brain's ultra sensitive filtration system. So it's going to help to ensure that chemicals that or other toxins or products that are in your general blood circulation are not necessarily going to be able to access the brain circulation. So it separates brain circulation, in a sense, from general circulation. They also create a three-dimensional framework for the central nervous system. They're going to help to support neurons in the central nervous system. They can repair some damaged nervous tissue. They help guide new neuron development and control interstitial environment. So summarizing again, looking at this cell, this is the astrocyte with all of its little arms coming off. And again, it's going to maintain the blood-brain barrier, give support, and also regulate the environment in the interstitial fluid. Next, we have ependymal cells, and this is an ependymal cell. We find these forming the epithelium that lines the central canal of the spinal cord and the ventricles of the brain. They will produce and monitor cerebrospinal fluid, which is huge. Cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, is going to surround the brain and spinal cord and is always being recycled and circulated. And part of what's going to help with that are the ependymal cells because they have cilia to help circulate the cerebrospinal fluid. So here's a great picture of the ependymal cells, and here's their cilia 
where they can sweep cerebrospinal fluid around. Um, we could also see back here, here's another astrocyte picture, and there's the astrocyte using its little arms um, to anchor on to capillaries to help form the blood-brain barrier. So next we have oligodendrocytes, and these guys have very small cell bodies with very few processes they form what is called a myelin sheath. Myelin is super important because it's going to insulate some axons. The axons that are insulated by this myelin are called myelinated axons. And what that does is it actually is going to speed up the action potentials that go through the neuron. When we insulate the neurons, action potentials go faster. So we'll talk about that a little more in the second half. It also makes nerves appear white. So myelin gives nerves a white and shiny appearance. So going a little further on the oligodendrocyte, we have some areas that we can name on a myelinated neuron. So the internodes are the myelinated segments of axon. The nodes, or nodes of Renvier, are going to be the areas between the internodes. Axons can branch in these areas. White matter is um, going to constitute the region of the central nervous system that has a lot of myelinated axons. Gray matter is going to contain unmyelinated axons, um, and so we can really see that gray, grainy appearance we talked about in the cell bodies of these uh, particular neurons. So going back, we have the oligodendrocyte here, which are largely responsible for myelination, which means they are going to, here is another one, oligodendrocyte um, has wrapped itself around and around and around and around, kind of like electrical tape around a bare wire. Um, here's our axon and then here's the wrapping around and around and around forming layers to insulate the axon which we'll find out later again is going to help the neuron send signals quicker. Okay so next we have the microglia and microglia are the smallest and least numerous of the neuroglia. They have very fine little branches and they can migrate. So they're able to move back and forth through nervous tissue. Their job is to clean up waste. So they're gonna clean up cellular waste, pathogens that could have gotten into the nervous tissue. So think of them as the cleanup crew. So this guy is a microglial cell with his little fine, fine, fine projections. So that was the neuroglia of the central nervous system. So now we're moving into the neuroglia of the peripheral nervous system, which is, there's only two. So that's easy enough to keep straight. The two types are satellite cells and then Schwann cells. So satellite cells look like this, and they're going to surround neuron cell bodies in the ganglia that we previously um, defined. They're going to regulate gases like oxygen and CO2, and also the nutrients and neurotransmitter levels around the ganglia. Schwann cells are also responsible for myelination just like the oligodendrocytes, but they look a little different with how they do it. So let's go to the satellite cell again. So the satellite cells are going to surround the ganglia, which remember are clusters of cell bodies in the PNS, and they're going to regulate the fluid around the neurons. We said they're going to monitor gases like oxygen and CO2, 
Schwann cells are going to form myelin sheaths around the axons in the peripheral nervous system. So again, they're going to do what the oligodendrocyte did for the central nervous system. The neurolemma is the outer surface of the Schwann cell, and a myelinating Schwann cell can sheath only one axon. So it takes multiple Schwann cells to sheath an entire axon. So let's take a look at that. So here is a neuron with its axon very clear here. And you can see that each one of these little units, so there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, and so on, each of those is an individual Schwann cell. And the Schwann cell wraps around and around with its whole body, so it kind of reminds me of like a little cellular hug around this axon. And you can see that, as we mentioned before, um, the area where the Schwann cell is, just like in the oligodendrocyte, is called the internode. And the gaps where you can still see the exposed axon here and there and there and there, those are nodes, also known as nodes of Ranvier. Okay, so this is a myelinated axon, and again, you can see the Schwann cell has wrapped itself around multiple times. Okay, so this is a very clearly myelinated neuron. Now in this picture, this is, these would be considered unmyelinated. So we've got a neuron here, and then we've got some additional axons here from other neurons. And you can see that there are Schwann cells here, but the Schwann cell has actually kind of created a little pocket for the axon. But if we zoom in tightly, this is the relationship between the Schwann cell and the axons. You can see that the Schwann cell is not giving a complete hug. We have an open area, so the axons are exposed, not fully covered. So this would be considered unmyelinated because we're not really fully wrapped like we were here. Each individual axon was wrapped fully by a big bear hug. And then here we've got several axons, one Schwann cell, but it is not a complete hug. So we've got exposure, which makes this an unmyelinated um, neuron. Okay, and this is just closed, uh, a close-up of the same exact thing where we have little pockets for the axons to live, but there's still gaps. So we have unmyelinated axons here. So all plasma cell membranes produce electrical signals by moving ions around in the cell. This is called membrane potential. And this begins really the second half of the chapter, which is the story of how neurons actually communicate with one another and with other cells in the body. Membrane potential is super important to neurons. For the difference in electrical potential between the inside and outside of the cell is measured in millivolts. So we're going to see how important that is as we go a little further in the chapter. So again, the difference in electrical potential between the inside and outside of the cell is measured in millivolts. And this is the story of the membrane potential and electrical signals that we're going to need in order to make neurons communicate with one another. Okay, so now it's time to talk about how neurons actually communicate and send their signals. Membrane potential can be broken up into three main groups. We have resting membrane potential, which is the membrane potential of a resting cell. So one that is not doing anything involving communication. It's just kind of resting and hanging out. Graded potential is the temporary localized change in resting potential. This is caused by a stimulus. So in this phase, we're kind of getting primed to start communicating. We're getting there. And then action potential is an electrical impulse 
that is produced by the graded potential and will travel or propagate along the surface of the axon to the synapse, which is what we want. So when neurons communicate, we want an action potential to travel down the axon and we want it to cause the synaptic terminals, which were those little buttons at the end of the axon, to potentially release a chemical called a neurotransmitter. And then that will cause either another cell to react or some kind of event to occur. So that's where we're trying to go. That's our overview. We want to have an action potential to result in um, the release of a neurotransmitter or communication at the synaptic terminal. So resting membrane potential, there are three important concepts. The extracellular fluid, so this would be the fluid outside the cell, and the intracellular fluid, or cytosol, this is the fluid inside the cell, differ very much in their composition of ions. Extracellular fluid contains high concentrations of sodium and chloride. So you're going to see a lot of sodium and chloride on the outside of the cell. And the cytosol, or inside of the cell, contains high concentrations of potassium and negatively charged proteins. Cells have selectively permeable membranes, so they're very picky about what goes in and out of the cell. Membrane permeability will vary by ion. Okay, so we're going to come back to these figures in just a minute. The passive processes acting across the cell membrane. We've got chemical gradients, so there are concentration gradients of ions, sodium and potassium. Electrical gradients, where charges are separated by the cell membrane. Cytosol is negative relative to the extracellular fluid. So the inside of cells is negative compared to the extracellular fluid. Again, largely because of the negative proteins that are inside the cell that are not going anywhere. So we can have active processes across the membrane where ions move back and forth. I'm going to show you what that looks like in just a second. And we've got um, a protein pump called the sodium potassium pump, which is powered by ATP or energy and is going to balance the passive force of diffusion. So diffusion, remember, is when ions flow from a high concentration to a low concentration. So as ions begin to flow across the cell membrane, the sodium potassium pump will correct that ion flow by balancing it. So we're going to have sodiums and potassiums pumped in and out by the sodium potassium exchange pump. So let's take a look at what all that means by going back to these two figures. So in this figure, what we're looking at is the cell membrane here. And we've also got um, a channel here. So this is a protein channel. And this particular one is called a potassium leak channel. Um, and potassium in this figure is represented by these little orangey, kind of peachy colored um, circles. So you can see there's quite a bit of potassium inside the cell, not very much outside the cell. So potassium leak channels are what are known as passive channels. They're going to allow potassium to just leak out. Imagine it like a leaky faucet. And remember that diffusion works by allowing ions to flow from a high to a low concentration passively. So these are all of our potassiums. And you see that there are quite a few on the inside, very few on the outside. So according to diffusion, we're going to go from high to low passively. So potassium will flow out naturally. The same is true over here. We have a sodium leak channel, and in this drawing, sodium is represented by the purple circles. You can see that there is a lot of sodium out here, very little inside, 
So according to diffusion, we're going to go from high to low. So sodium is going to passively leak in because this is a leak channel. It's always open. So we're going to leak in. And as potassium leaks out and sodium leaks in, this is going to change the dynamics of the charges. So notice that right now the outside of the membrane is positively charged and the inside of the membrane is negatively charged. So as we have this passive leakage, this is going to kind of change the dynamic of a resting cell. So we have the sodium potassium pump here in the middle of these two guys and his job is to maintain the normal concentration gradients of sodium and potassium across the membrane. So what the sodium potassium pump will do is pump sodium back out where it belongs and pump potassium back in where it belongs. So it is going to correct the passive leakage. The sodium potassium pump works by ATP, so it's powered. And it has to be powered because it's pumping against the concentration gradient, which is not natural flow. So the sodium potassium pump actually pumps out three sodium for every two potassium it brings in. So we call it a three to two ratio. So the story goes this way. A lot of sodium outside, very little inside. Sodium leaks in naturally and passively. Sodium potassium pump says, hey you guys, not so fast. Get back out to where you belong. And the same thing is true over here. There's a lot of potassium inside the cell, very little outside. Potassium leaks out naturally and passively. And the sodium potassium pump says, nope, not so fast. You get back into where you belong. So for every pump of the sodium potassium pump, we are pumping out three sodium for every two potassium, which we call a three to two ratio. And we can see that in our notes here as well. Um, so again, sodium potassium pump powered by ATP ejects three sodium for every two potassium brought in, which balances passive diffusion. Why do we care about this? Why do we need the balance? Well, what this will do is keep us at rest, keeps the cell at resting membrane potential. And remember I told you that um, membrane potential is measured in millivolts. So when our neuron is at rest, we can measure it and we find that a resting neuron is going to be at negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so whenever a neuron is at rest, this is the number we should expect to see negative 70 millivolts. Now we're going to mess this all up when we start an action potential, which is the process of the neuron communicating, which is what we said was the goal of this conversation is we want the neuron to communicate and release the neurotransmitter and in order to do that this negative 70 is going to go out the window but we first needed to understand that neurons when they are resting are going to be clocked right here at negative 70 millivolts so if we go back to the second image here um, we already talked about the electrical gradient and what I mean by that is the outside of the membrane is more positive than the inside which is more negative. So as it mentions here in this write-up, potassium leaves the cytoplasm more quickly than sodium enters because the plasma membrane is more permeable to potassium than to sodium. So there's more positive charge outside the plasma membrane negative protein molecules like these guys within the cytoplasm can't cross the plasma membrane. So there are more negative charges on the inside of the plasma membrane. And this is going to create our electrical gradient across the membrane, our positive to negative. So whenever positive ions and negative ions are held apart, this creates what is called a potential difference which is our membrane potential, and we measure that in millivolts. The resting membrane potential of a neuron 
is going to be about negative 70 millivolts. The negative sign shows us that the inner surface of the plasma membrane is negative compared with the exterior of the membrane. So you can see this little um, probe here inside the membrane is clocking this neuron at negative 70 millivolts, which means that it is resting. Okay, so resting membrane potential exists because the cytosol differs, as we just talked about, from extracellular fluid in chemical and ionic composition. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable, and the membrane potential can change when it responds to a change in membrane permeability by opening or closing specific membrane channels. And this is going to happen in response to a stimulus. So that's usually when a neuron will react, when there's some kind of stimulus. Sodium and potassium are the primary determinants of membrane potential. Sodium and potassium channels are either passive or active. We already touched on this a little bit. Passive ion channels are known as leak channels. We just looked at those in our figure. They're always open and their permeability can change with conditions. Active ion channels are known as gated ion channels. These are not always open. They will open or close in response to stimuli. At resting membrane potential, that's when we're at negative 70, most of them will be closed. Active channels can include chemically gated ion channels, voltage gated ion channels, and mechanically gated ion channels. So let's start with chemically gated ion channels. Sometimes these are called ligand gated ion channels, and they open when they bind to specific chemicals. For example, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is abbreviated as ACH. We looked at that in chapter 10 when we talked about muscle contraction. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. It's found, or these gated ion channels are found on cell body and dendrites of neurons. Voltage gated ion channels respond to changes in membrane potential. They're found in axons of neurons and the sarcolemma of skeletal and cardiac muscle cells. So we did talk about those um, in skeletal muscle. Activation gate opens when they're stimulated and inactivation gate closes to stop ion movement. So we're going to take a look at a picture of that too if that's not quite making sense. Mechanically gated ion channels respond to membrane disruption um, or distortion. And this is found in sensory receptors that respond to vibration, touch, or pressure. So here's a picture of a chemically gated ion channel. Um, so just to orient you, we have the plasma membrane here. This is extracellular fluid or outside of the cell. And this is the cytosol or inside of the cell. You can see that this channel is closed. This is a sodium channel and it is closed. If a chemical like acetylcholine comes in and binds to the channel, the channel opens, which is why we call it a chemically gated ion channel. Channel opens and sodium rushes in. When the acetylcholine is no longer present, the channel will close. Sodium is unable to come in any longer. Voltage gated ion channel is again um, going to be controlled by membrane potential changes. So here's our membrane. Here's our voltage gated ion channel. You can see that it is closed. This is the activation gate closed up. We are at rest and we know that because it says negative 70. If we are stimulated and the membrane potential changes, so you can see it's now negative 60, there's been a change. If the membrane potential changes, the activation gate opens, sodium rushes in.
Once we reach a certain membrane potential, in this case positive 30, and we've gotten to our highest point, our channel then inactivates. So you can see the inactivation gate has closed. Sodium can no longer come in. We've reached our max. Mechanically gated ion channel, this is the one that only opens in response to a distortion of the membrane. So you can see the channel is closed. Here is some sodium hanging out on the outside and suddenly the membrane has pressure applied to it. This causes the channel to open. Sodium begins to rush in. If the pressure is taken away, then the channel will then close. So action potentials are nerve impulses and they're propagated changes in the membrane potential. Remember propagated means travels. It can affect an entire excitable membrane and begins at the initial segment of the axon. Remember we pointed out where the initial segment was at the beginning of the chapter. These do not diminish as they move away from the source. They stay strong as they go along the axon. They're stimulated by a graded potential that depolarizes the axolemma, which is the membrane of the axon, to threshold. Threshold for an axon is negative 70 to negative, or negative 60 to negative 55. So what that means is if we want to have an action potential, which is our goal here, we need to at least have the membrane potential change to negative 60 or negative 55. That's, that means we are on our way to an action potential. That's the minimum requirement. Okay, so here's a great picture of the cell body of a neuron. Our axon hillock, which is the thickened area of the axon. And remember, right beside it is the initial segment. So this is where we're going to actually begin an action potential if we have one. So action potentials work by an all or none principle. Any stimulus that changes the membrane to threshold, changes the potential to threshold, will cause an action potential. It's going to happen. All action potentials are the same once they get started. So no matter how big the stimulus is, an action potential is either triggered or it's not triggered. It's all or none. So in order to have an action potential, step one is we need to depolarize the neuron to threshold. Now depolarization, we did talk about it back in chapter 10. That means when we go from a negative membrane potential, like negative 70, towards zero or positive. So we're going to change that membrane potential to a more positive number. That's depolarization. We want this. So depolarization to threshold, that's our minimum. Remember, we need to get to at least negative 60, negative 55. And if we do, that's going to activate depolarization to continue, and sodium channels will open, and we're going to have full depolarization. So that's when sodium rushes into the cytosol, and the inner membrane will change from negative to positive. This is what we call rapid depolarization. So this is step one and two, and here's a figure of that. So in this picture, we have our membrane, which is red in this image. This represents the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. You can see our probe here, and then in purple, we have our sodium channel. And in peach, we have our potassium channel. So the purple guys out here, this is sodium, and the peach ones are potassium. So step one, we need a stimulus to be strong enough to get us to threshold. Remember, threshold is negative 60 to negative 55. So you can see that our sodium channel is starting to respond, is starting to open because we did reach threshold. So since we reached threshold, sodium channel will sling open, as you can see here, and sodium will begin to rush in. Okay, And all that positivity rushing into the cell 
is going to bring positivity into the cell. We call that rapid depolarization because we went from negative 70 and we're now at positive 10. So that's a big change towards the positive. The inner membrane surface has now more positive ions than negative. So the membrane potential goes from negative to a positive number. So sodium rushed in, bringing positivity. Our number goes up. That is depolarization. Step three, inactivation of sodium channels and activation of potassium channels. So once we go all the way up, we saw that we were just at positive 10. Once we go up, the highest we can go is positive 30. So we're going to top out at positive 30. When we get to positive 30, inactivation gates of sodium channels close. Voltage gated potassium channels will then open and potassium will move out. That is called repolarization. So we started with depolarization, which is when we went from negative 70 towards positive 30. And once we get to positive 30, that's as positive as we can get. So at that point, depolarization ends. Potassium channels will open and potassium will leave, making our cell more negative, which we call repolarization. So refreshing you on repolarization definition. So when we go from a positive membrane potential, like positive 30, for example, back down towards negative or rest. So we're going to head back down towards negative 70 to reset and get ready for a new action potential. Okay, so here we are at positive 30. Once we get to positive 30 of depolarization, sodium channels will close. And you can see, in fact, sodium channel did close. So no more sodium can come in. Once the sodium channel closes, the potassium channel opens. And remember, there's a lot more potassium inside than outside, so potassium is going to naturally flow out. When potassium flows out, it takes with it all that positivity, which is going to shift the membrane potential back toward rest. Or negative. We call that repolarization. So repolarization, potassium goes out, which brings us back towards negative 70 or rest. Repolarization. So step four, we return to resting membrane potential. As we get near negative 70, the voltage gated potassium channels begin to close. As the membrane gets close to resting potential, potassium continues to sneak out. So we actually let out a little bit more potassium than needed to get to negative 70. So we're going to overshoot a bit. We're going to actually go all the way to about negative 90. That's called hyperpolarization. When we go a little too far, after all the voltage gated potassium channels close, resting membrane potential will be restored. So we will go from negative 90 back up to negative 70, and at that point the action potential is over. So hyperpolarization is when we overshoot and we go all the way to negative 90. So in this image, we allowed potassium to go out. We got towards about negative 70, which was where rest was. And the channel is closing very slowly, so we let a little extra potassium sneak out and we overshoot to negative 90. We call that hyperpolarization, which is an overshoot, but it's very brief. After all the voltage gated potassium channels close, we will reset to normal resting level, which is negative 70, and that means the action potential is over and the neuron is at rest, ready to do this all over again. The refractory period is from the beginning of the action potential all the way to the end or the return of the resting state. During this time, the membrane will not respond to any additional stimuli. Okay, recap. 
depolarization results from an influx of sodium. So remember, we started at negative 70, which was rest. We wanted to have an action potential. If there is a stimulus, a bright light in your eyes, a bug bites your arm, you feel heat from the sun, any of those are good examples of stimuli. If there is a stimulus, that can cause sodium channels to open. Sodium will rush in. We go from negative 70 up towards positive 30. That's called depolarization. When we get to positive 30, sodium channels close. Potassium channels open. Potassium leaves. That makes our number go from positive 30 back down towards positive or towards negative 70. That is called repolarization. As we get close to negative 70, we let a little extra potassium out and we overshoot a bit to negative 90. We call that hyperpolarization. The sodium potassium pump will help to return the concentration of sodium and potassium to normal levels. So we'll go back to negative 70, which we call rest, and we will continue to maintain that normal concentration gradient unless we're ready to have a new action potential. So the last thing to talk about is propagation. Propagation is the movement of an action potential along an axon, which is actually a series of repeated steps. There are two types of propagation, continuous and saltatory. So let's begin with continuous. Continuous propagation occurs only in unmyelinated axons. Remember, these are the ones that are not wrapped with myelin sheaths. It affects one segment of an axon at a time. In step one, we have an action potential develop at the initial segment, which we should expect. We will depolarize the membrane to positive 30. And then we have what's called a local current that will spread the stimulus to the next segment. Okay, so let's take a look at this in images. So what you're looking at here is the cell membrane. And you can see that it has been, for simplicity, it's been divided up into segment one, segment two, segment three. Each segment has uh, a probe in it so that we can see what the membrane potential is in that area. This is our extracellular fluid or outside the cell. And this is our cytosol or inside the cell. So what's going to happen is we have a stimulus, which is shown in red. Remember, a stimulus causes sodium channels to open. Sodium rushes in. All that positivity coming in is going to take our number from negative 70 membrane potential up towards positive 30. This is depolarization. Once the sodium rushes in, it will actually spread forward as what's called a local current. So you can see the sodium is moving forward towards segment two. When the sodium begins to move towards segment two, this will actually stimulate segment two um, to threshold, which remember is negative 60 to negative 55. If we reach threshold, this will cause segment two to depolarize. So we're going to see in segment two, sodium channels will open here, sodium will rush in, and that's going to take our number up to positive 30, which we call depolarization. So the action potential, as we just said, will begin to occur in the second segment. The initial segment we just left will begin to repolarize. Okay. So let's look at that now. So we stimulated segment two. Sodium channels open. Sodium rushed in. Sodium rushes in. This takes our number from negative 70 up to positive 30. We call that depolarization. So what do you think is going to happen with these sodium ions? Well, just like we saw here, they're going to sweep forward in the local current.
So these sodium ions will sweep forward towards segment three. This will stimulate segment three to threshold. Then sodium channels will open. Sodium will rush in in segment three, which will take this number from negative 70 towards positive 30, depolarization. But meanwhile, what's going on in the initial segment? So we're depolarizing in segment two right now, so what should be going on here? Well, the answer is repolarization. Since we've already depolarized, we got all the way to positive 30. Remember, sodium channels close, potassium channels open, potassium rushes out. So as potassium rushes out, all that positivity leaves the cell and that makes our number more negative. So we're heading towards negative 70, which is repolarization. But remember, we overshoot a bit towards negative 90. This segment is in refractory, which means it cannot be stimulated. This is good because it means that the action potential, which is now in segment two, can't backtrack towards segment one. We want to go in a forward direction. We do not want to backtrack. Okay, so segment two will then spread its local current towards segment three. It is now at threshold, so guess what's going to happen now? Sodium channels will open. Sodium will rush in. This will cause our number to go all the way up to positive 30. When we go up to positive 30, um, sodium channels will close. Meanwhile, segment two will go into repolarization, where potassium channels open, potassium will go out, which brings us back towards resting membrane potential, or negative 70, and then we will overshoot a bit to negative 90. Segment two will be in refractory, meaning it can't be stimulated. This, again, forces the action potential to go only in one direction, which is forward. So what we want to happen is at the end of this propagation, we want the synaptic terminals to release a neurotransmitter at the end of our action potential, which is where we're going. We're trying to carry this down to the end of the axon where we can release a neurotransmitter. So that was continuous propagation, which is what's going to happen in an unmyelinated neuron. Um, it's a bit slower, still pretty fast, but it's a bit slower than this one, which is called saltatory propagation. Saltatory propagation is going to happen in myelinated axons, so axons that are covered with myelin. This is faster than continuous propagation and does require less energy. Myelin prevents continuous propagation. The local current will jump from node to node, and depolarization will only have to happen at the nodes. So let's take a look at that in pictures. So here's our neuron. This is our membrane. This is the outside of the cell or extracellular fluid. This is the cytosol. And what you can see here is this is our myelin. So it could be an oligodendrocyte. Remember those that wrap the cell or it could be a Schwann cell. Those are the ones that hug the axon. So this myelination or insulation represents areas we can skip over. In continuous propagation, we had to stimulate every single piece of that neuron. In a myelinated neuron, we can skip the chunks of myelin, which are called the internodes, and we only have to go through depolarization and repolarization at the nodes, which is a wonderful um, and fast way to get to the end quicker because we're going to be able to leapfrog over the myelinated areas. Okay, so we're being stimulated at node one. You can see by the reddening of the membrane. When we're stimulated, this causes sodium channels to open, sodium will rush in. That's depolarization. Remember, we go from negative 70 towards positive 30. I know this is repetitive, but it can be a little complicated to grasp, so I'd rather be repetitive than not clear 
So once the sodium rushes in and we get all the way to positive 30, remember that at that point sodium channels will close and we will begin to go into repolarization, which is when we go from positive 30 back down towards resting potential. And we do that by allowing potassium to leave. Now this picture doesn't show any potassium. It really only tells the story of the sodium, but you should know that that's still occurring. So once the sodium rushes in, where does it go now? The local current, just like in continuous, presses that sodium forward towards segment two or node two. Notice we're just bypassing this whole myelinated section, which allows us to skip a big chunk of uh, membrane. That's great. It's way faster. So we head on to node two. When we get to node two with this sodium, that stimulates node two to threshold, which will cause sodium channels to open. Sodium will rush in, taking our number from negative 70 to positive 30. We call that depolarization. Meanwhile, segment one is in repolarization. Potassium is going out. Our number is going back towards negative 70, and we overshoot a bit to negative 90. We're now in refractory, meaning that this segment is unable to be stimulated until it returns back to resting potential. Now that the sodium has rushed in, where is it going to go? It's going to sweep forward in the local current to segment three, again skipping over this big myelinated chunk, which again is wonderful because it makes it quicker. We're leapfrogging over. So when we sweep forward towards segment three, that's going to cause segment or node three to go to threshold, and then it will cause sodium to rush in, and we will fully depolarize to positive 30. Meanwhile, back in node two, we're going to be undergoing repolarization and refractory. So we are jumping, jumping, jumping to the end. The steps for continuous propagation and saltatory propagation are identical. First depolarization, then repolarization, and hyperpolarization. Exact same story, but we're just jumping over the myelinated sections which helps us get to the end much faster. Axon diameter can affect propagation speed of the action potential. The larger the diameter, the lower the resistance, and the faster the speed of the action potential. The synapse is the site where a neuron communicates with another cell. We have what's called the presynaptic neuron. That's the neuron that is sending the message, the one doing the talking. And the postsynaptic neuron, which is the one that's receiving the message or doing the listening. So presynaptic is doing the talking and postsynaptic is doing the listening. Types of synapses. There are electrical synapses where there is direct physical contact between the cells. And there are chemical synapses where there is a signal transmitted across a gap by neurotransmitters. We saw that in chapter 10 when we drew out um, in our, or we saw in our figure, the synaptic cleft, which was the gap between the synaptic terminal and the postsynaptic cell, which in that case happened to be a muscle cell. And the neurotransmitter was the chemical message or messenger that brought that signal across the gap. Chemical synapses are the most common type of synapse between neurons. Um, the only type of synapse between neurons and other cells. Cells are, synaptic, are separated by a synaptic cleft. The presynaptic cell sends the message and the postsynaptic cell receives the message. So here's a good picture of that. This is our teledendria and this is our axon terminal or synaptic terminal. And this represents our postsynaptic cell. So it could be another neuron or it could be a muscle cell. It could be a multitude of things, but it's not specific in this picture. Uh, just like in chapter 10 when we talked about muscle, the action potential comes down 
and will cause the synaptic vesicles or secretory vesicles that are filled with a neurotransmitter to release the neurotransmitter into the cleft, which is the gap between the synaptic terminal and the postsynaptic cell. When that neurotransmitter is released into that cleft, it will then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell and some event will take place. Types of chemical synapses, example, neuromuscular junction, that was our chapter 10 talk, um, which is a synapse between the neuron and a skeletal muscle cell. A neuroglandular junction, which is a synapse between the neuron and a gland cell. Neurotransmitters, again, are chemical messengers that are inside of synaptic or secretory vesicles. They're found in the synaptic terminal of the presynaptic cell. When the, neuro, or when the neuron is stimulated, these neurotransmitters will be released into the synaptic cleft and as I previously mentioned, can affect receptors of the postsynaptic cell. They're then broken down by enzymes, reabsorbed and reassembled by the synaptic or axon terminal. The function of these chemical synapses. The axon terminal releases neurotransmitters that will bind to the post synaptic membrane. This can cause a localized change in permeability and graded potentials. In other words, it can make the postsynaptic cell do something depending on what the neurotransmitter is. It can, it can um, cause a reaction. Action potential may or may not be generated in the postsynaptic cell. So it could cause, if the postsynaptic cell is another neuron, it could cause that neuron to undergo its own action potential. And that can be dependent on the amount of neurotransmitter released and the sensitivity of that postsynaptic cell. So that concludes chapter 12 on nervous tissue. I'll see you in chapter 14 for more nervous system.